Well, okay. So, okay, it is sharp six, six o'clock in Indian Standard Time, so we'll kickstart this. Uh, okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to yet another informat, I would say, interesting conversation with IPN and people who are joining us for the first time uh, from different geographies, if I may say. Welcome to IPN session with uh, Professor uh, and I said, Professor Dor Abramanson, he's from University of California, Berkeley. And we have a very interesting session with Professor uh, ahead of us today, in fact. And as a matter of fact, I will start with a brief introduction uh, about uh, and the topic what we have in our hand. Uh, obviously, we'll usually do in a similar sort of a format we've been doing all this while. In fact, it's been now almost six months. Uh, I remember sharing this with Professor last evening when we were having a quick conversation that we started these dialogues on 29th of March in 29th, in fact, March. And this last, well, yesterday was 29th of September. It's almost exact six months uh, since we've been doing this. Okay, so a very interesting topic, as I mentioned uh, ahead of us, uh, which is uh, uh, learning is moving in new ways. Uh, we all have our own sort of uh, interpretation to this, but we today will look forward to have a professor helping us uh, understand this better. So, as I mentioned, uh, just a quick brief introduction of Professor Dor. Professor Dor uh, Abrahamson, in fact, is a PhD from Learning Sciences from Northwestern University in the year 2004, is a professor at the Graduate School of Education, University of California, Berkeley, where he runs the Embodied Design Research Laboratory, which is interesting, as I said, Ebramanson is a design-based researcher who invents pedagogical technologies for teaching and learning mathematics. He analyzes data gathered in evaluating these products to develop theoretical models of cognitive and social process leading to insight and fluency. Uh, Dr. Professor Dor is, is particularly interested in relations between learning to move in new ways and learning mathematics concept. His research has been funded by the federal agencies and private foundations. Otherwise, Dor, Professor Dor enjoys playing the cello, hiking, biking, reading, and spending time with his family and pets. So, Professor, welcome to the session, and uh, we look Thank forward you. to a very, very interesting conversation ahead of us. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Marva. Just to make sure, can you see my slide of Berkeley? Yes, sir. We, we can see that. Yes. Everything's working. Okay. Thanks again, Gaurava, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for spending with me an hour uh, of your evening. I trust you're all very busy people. And it's a great privilege for me to be speaking to many fine educational leaders from India today. I greatly admire Indian culture, especially your philosophy, your music and of course the amazing cuisine. <laughs> I do <laughs> yoga every day, and so I feel spiritually connected to your vast subcontinent. That said, it's 5.30 in the morning here, so when I was just now doing my sun salutations, the sun was not quite out yet to receive my benedictions. Today's talk will be in English, but I thought I might begin with a salute to one of your local languages. At least I will try. Now, bear with me because this will be a joke about mathematics. And as you might expect, mathematics is not usually much of a laughing matter. So it won't be too funny, but I will try. So it, it goes like this. A student said to a math teacher, Sir, English teachers speak in English. Why don't you speak in math? The teacher replied, well, no, no, I thought it won't be too funny, no, no, but I tried. Try. I, I should say good, good attempt, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> this is the view you see of, uh, of Berkeley, looking across the bay to San Francisco. On your left is the Carillion Tower, which rings the bells that we can hear from the campus to the whole town. Now, my talk today for you, the Indian Principles Network, is part of the Matific uh, webinars. 
as Gaurav has said, my name is Dora Abramson. I'm from the Embodied Design Research Laboratory, which I run. And here's our logo. And we are situated in the Graduate School of Education, University of California, Berkeley. Now, the name of the talk is Learning is Moving in New Ways. And this really has a, a two kinds of meanings. It's a bit of a pun. On the one hand, I mean human learning, uh, the way that it is designed for and facilitated now, this whole vast global uh, movement is moving in new ways. There are new ways, new horizons, new possibilities with new technologies to change the, 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 the nature and the quality of human learning. So it's moving. But there's another meaning to le learning is moving in new ways, which I want to discuss today. And that is that human uh, thinking, our, our mind, our cognition is based in movement. We all began from mammals on this planet who have sensory motor capacities. And many philosophies this, these days are saying that when we think, even when we think about things seem abstract as mathematics, actually our thinking, our cognitive activity is grounded in this sensory motor capacity that we all have. So I wanna talk about envisioning digital horizons for mathematics educations. Where's all of this going? What is the future? What are the ancient philosophies moving forward telling us about the future of mathematics education? So this will be a talk about some ideas from theory and philosophy and how I use these ideas, how I implement them in the form of actual designs that I create and work with, with children. Okay, so let us start from uh, mentioning uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Arthur Glenberg. And he is kind of skeptical about educational technology. I'm sure all of you as, as, uh, as principals, you are uh, often thinking about now, what educational technology should I adopt for my school, for my students, for my teachers, for my district? How should I even begin to think about it? What forms of educational technology might be useful? How should we even conceptualize this? So Arthur uh, Glenberg, Professor Glenberg says, well, he says, uh, because, and in fact, he's talking about education technology. One can view most of my reasons for skepticism as challenges for the future of development of technology that is sensitive to the principles of biological cognitive systems. We are all biological cognitive systems. That's our minds. Now, the idea is like, if we want to understand what educational technologies we should be uh, creating, using, uh, adopting, Maybe we should begin by asking, wait a moment, what is the mind such that it can understand mathematics? So this is the, the parting point of my talk. What is the mind such that it can understand mathematics? And what therefore could be the role of technology in enabling the mind to grasp these uh, amazing ideas, the, the, the jewel of, of civilization, mathematics? Is mathematics really something abstract just about symbols? Or maybe it's actually about objects, imaginary objects that we can hold and we can manipulate and we can imagine together. Maybe mathematical uh, ideas are not just about all these symbolic notations that we write on paper and we process and we get an answer and we get an A plus teacher. <laughs> Maybe the ideas are not too different from real concrete objects that we manipulate with our hands because that's what evolution brought us to. That is the point we got to. That is the nature and quality of the mind. So when we talk about technology that is sensitive to the principles of biological cognitive systems, right? what are these principles of biological cognitive systems? And therefore, how should we design technology for learning? All right. So this, is, so this is my friend Arthur Glenberg, and I, I'm going to try to respond to his challenge. He is a good friend and colleague, and he, he wrote this because he's looking around at educational technology and saying most of it, it just took school business as usual and simply slapped it onto a screen, right? Just like in the history of, of, of media, you know, when, when, oh yes, when the camera was ready, the movie camera, the movie motion camera was a, when it was invented, first thing they did with it, they put it in front of a stage on a tripod and, you know, uh, and, the, and they acted out a play until one day somebody said, hey, we can move this camera around and that's how cinema was born, right? 
what is technology right now? We're in this transition point where we still think, many of us, oh, it's business as usual, slap it on the screen. Maybe technology can do more. Maybe technology can help us create opportunities for children, for everyone to learn mathematics by interacting with things, interacting in ways that go beyond the screen, outside of the screen. Maybe it's about objects. Maybe it's about moving in new ways. So what is thinking? What is human thinking? People used to say, oh yes, the mind, the brain. It's kind of like a computer, they would say. So there's all of these phenomena out there in the world and they send us senses to of touch, of taste, of smell, of sight. We get uh, idea of, we get hearing and then we take all of this and we process it like a computer, they said, in the mind and aha, then we send some instruction to the body. This is how you should behave, all right? So that is a metaphor of the mind like a computer, which was popular in the 20th century, as if the brain is processing these symbolic uh, bits of information that have nothing to do with the body, have, have nothing to do with, with not, neither the senses nor the way uh, we, we move. But philosophy is taking us to other places on beyond the computer metaphor and saying, actually, there are no uh, symbolic bits of information in the brain. No matter how much we scanned, we didn't find that. Rather, it turns out human thinking is inherently about sensing and moving in the same time. There is only one kind of being. This is our animal being, which is about being in the world. Even when we think with our eyes closed, all alone in a dark room, still thinking, uh, cognitive activity is inherently about moving. It's inherently about being in the world. It's inherently about imagining objects and interacting with them. So you see, this is quite a shift away from the 20th century metaphor of the brain as some kind of, you know, uh, computer central processing unit. And it's taking us to a different place as saying, oh, thinking is, is moving in, in certain ways. Thinking is engaging the world, even when our eyes are closed, even when we're thinking about ideas that seem to be abstract like mathematics. They say, no, mathematics is also a way of being in the world. It's a type of cognitive activity. True, there are all these symbolic notations, but those are ways of labeling and extending that kind of uh, thinking that is inherently about the body, that is always concrete. So if I have one take home message today, it goes like this. I'm gonna slap on some text onto a wall of text. The brain is not a computer. It does not process abstract symbols or propositions. The act of thinking mobilizes the same sensory motor modalities by which we function in the natural and sociocultural environment. How we think, therefore, depends on how we know to move in the world, how we know to operate on various objects, what tools we have mastered, what languages we speak. As such, educators can affect students' cognitive development by shaping their sensory motor experiences with dedicated objects. Okay, that's a lot of words. And, and yet we are the educators and we are trying to affect students, to, to affect their cognitive development by shaping, right? By shaping their sensory motor experiences. How do we do that? How do we shape children's sensory motor experiences so that mathematics becomes like walking? I'm sure many of us here are parents. I'm a parent, right? Walking, uh, running, Children learn to do things, climbing trees. Why should we think that suddenly there's this rift and cut and say, oh, no, math is something completely different, abstract. No, the philosophies now are saying, the whole cognitive paradigm is saying, no, it's a kind of way of being in the world. It's a truly uh, spectacular and special way, but it's inherently about the mind, which is this mammalian mind, which can uh, interact with the world through its sensory motor capacities. And we need to try and find that thread. It's challenging, but that is the thread we can try and find so that the students that we foster in our schools are not just those that can go through algorithms, solve, solve, solve. They can be people where the ideas are grounded inside their sensory motor capacity so that they can think flexibly, so that they can discover, that they can invent, they can solve problems, they can be innovative. And it's all about bringing mathematics back to the body, reclaiming the body. So that was a wall of text. And now I want to invite you to an image that I am very fond of. So for all of you who have been fortunate enough to, to visit Europe and actually have gone to Italy, to Rome, if you were in the Vatican and you looked up, 
you may have seen this work by Michelangelo um, from the Renaissance. This particular work is called The Birth of Adam. So according to that Judean Christian of uh, mythology, that's uh, Adam on the left and that's uh, God on the right and, and Adam is being born. Now, why do I, I bring you this picture? Oh yes, maybe. I'll call, so I'll call this biological cognitive systems. This is a child. This is my metaphor today. This is a child who comes into the world and naked because that is symbolizing what evolution brought uh, that particular person to, to that moment. Okay, and oh, okay, just for some modesty. Now, uh, on the other hand, we have, we have uh, culture over here. So this is how the metaphor will work, right? And this will be culture that us teachers and we're looking at this place of, of oh yes, COVID, right? We, right. Uh, so we're looking at this place of connection between uh, the creating learning environments where we look, how do biological cognitive systems connect to cultural forms? The child comes with no speech yet, with no mathematics, just comes into the world and culture comes and says, oh child, here are all the things you need to know. And the kid says, what, but how do I, what, how, does, how is this connection fostered? How is this connection fostered between the biological cognitive systems the child brings to the world and these cultural forms that we wish to, to foster, okay? So this is what the talk is about. How do we create learning environments where biological cognitive systems, to use the language of Professor Glenberg, can interact with cultural forms? What is going on there between these two fingers? Because they never really, really truly connect, right? All of us here, we were once children, and all of us here now are adults with our cultural form. What does it mean for a child coming into this world with this evolutionarily um, a, a given capacities, endowed capacities, to come and interact and appropriate these cultural forms? How does this connection look, all right? And I'm uh, suggesting that technology, in all its forms, from paper and, and, and abacus, but also digital computers, um, various artificial intelligence, technology writ large can play a role in helping uh, biological cognitive systems appropriate cultural forms so that the understanding is deep, okay? So this is what Arthur Glenberg talks about. What is the future development of technology that is sensitive to the principle of biological cognitive systems? This is what we are trying to do. This is what we are trying to accomplish. And so I call this embodied design. That's my framework. And I'll just put some words here, and uh, I know the session is being recorded. If you want to go back, there'll be some words just to, to give an overview of, of what I do. So I'm looking to foster naturalistic learning of mathematics, and it's, it will always be goal-oriented. You're trying to get something done, and it's somehow you'll be adapting, just like uh, for millions of years we've been adapting, creates opportunities for children to adapt to the ecological contingencies that means what is going on in the situation now that I, as a child coming into this world, need, can adopt the cultural forms, so various forms and practices. Embodied design, my framework, it's a pedagogical framework for simulating naturalistic learning. I mean, I'm using technology to create situations are as if the child is in the natural world. And we create instructional activities that foster the development of sensory motor schemes for better motor control. So I come into uh, the design by thinking, how can I conceive this mathematical concept as some kind of form of motor control that I, can, that I can foster for children so that they move in new ways and through that understand the new, the new, the new uh, uh, ideas? Is that a hand there, Agora? I, I think we'll take up it later, that question, even if that there's a question, I'll take that up. Okay. okay. All right. So these new sensory motor schemes, they evolve centered on attentional anchors. I'll be explaining all of these ideas. There are certain ways that I want people to think. So never mind uh, all this uh, technical text, but when mathematical forms are introduced into the environment, I'm looking to create ways that students will adopt them, adopt them as kind of tools. So I want you to think of, just remember this metaphor of the two hands because I'll be using it throughout the talk. How do these two hands come together? What is the role of technology in making this happen? All right. So I work from a perspective called enactivism, which uh, is curiously a combination of cognitive science and, and Buddhist philosophy and started in, in Berkeley a few dozen years ago. And 
in a nutshell, it, there's two points here. One is that whenever we think of perception, human perception, it's always about guiding action. When we're looking at something, what our brain is actually doing is assessing how can we grab this. Every time you look at the environment, every time you make sense of the world, the animal brain is asking, how can I grab this? What is this? What, how should I respond? So perception is never static. Even when you look at lines on paper, it is never static. And the other uh, principle, there are only two principles here, cognitive structures, meaning the concept you want kids to, to learn, they emerge from these recurrent sensory motor patterns, from doing things over and over in new ways, seeing the world in new ways that enable action to be perceptually guided. So basically this is a philosophy that speaks to the nature of cognitive activity, such as learning mathematics and saying, it's always going to be, our brain is always seeking new ways of, of perceiving objects, interacting with the world and getting, gaining new footholds to try and, and engage with the world and manipulate things. So we need to stop thinking about mathematical concepts as things that are completely abstract and instead think of them as kinds of objects that we can manipulate, objects that we can bring into, into our own embodiment and, and interaction. So what are these concepts that we want to learn, I can ask as a designer, and therefore what sensory motor patterns should kids be engaging with as they move and what actions should they do? All right, so uh, when I create um, uh, new embodied design, when I create new technology for learning, I always ask myself, what do I wish for students to develop? What is a mathematical concept? How can I ground these ideas in terms of these dynamical invariants? What are the things there? What are the new things out there that people can, can see and grab onto? And therefore, what are the perceptual motor elements of this invariant? Again, all of this will become clearer through an, an example, but basically what I'm asking is, how can I take this philosophy and, and theory from, from, uh, em, of embodiment, from cognitive science, how can I take it and implement it in the form of learning mathematics? So let's ground it in, in things that are familiar to many teachers. Children want to learn, uh, need to learn about something called proportion. And you tell them, okay, my child, two blue glasses and three uh, yellow glasses I, I pour and I get this color green, okay? Now, next time I want to pour in four uh, blue glasses, how many yellow glasses should I, should I pour in? Now, many children will say to you, oh yes, um, so here you have, one more, so here you should have one more, it should be five. Or they might say, okay, there's two more here, so two more here, it should be five. But of course we know that it's the correct number should be six. And so this is my question, how do we create learning environments in which children will understand this in a way that is not just about rules, not just about when you see this number, this is what you should do, not just about keywords. How can we take this content and radically change it in ways that are more sensitive to our biological cognitive systems. How can we create certain objects here that children are interacting with so that they can gain a foothold on what these things really are? So what happens if we think differently about mathematics? So we're looking for some kind of embodied design for proportional equivalence. The first thing we did in the lab, we said, oh, let's create a pulley that has uh, uh, two wheels of different diameter and look at this as uh, Mark, is turning the cog. Uh, we see uh, Betsy holding on and her hands are going up at different speeds. So this was the very first time we figured out here, this is a way of moving. This is a way of moving proportionately. But on the other hand, of course, the problem with this is that she doesn't have any clear task and she doesn't have any clear control and it's difficult. Anyway, we decided to go, to go digital. Uh, around that time, uh, Chung Chung Lee, Johnny Chung Lee figured out how to hack uh, Wii Nintendo. So we said, we can do that too. So we created a, a video game where, well, not game, a learning environment. I hope the kids found it playful enough where the child needs to move two objects on a screen. So let me tell you about this. The child comes into a room and sits down and there's two remote controls. And of course, the question of media is, is flexible. If this could be on a tablet, this could be a Kinect, Wii Nintendo, this could be Leapfrog, that doesn't matter. The particular media come with various uh, possibilities, but I'm talking more generally about the activity architecture. So they come into this room, they don't even know they're doing mathematics, and they're told, try to make the screen green. Now, 
What they don't yet know is the screen will be green only. Where, okay, so the left hand is controlling up and down this cursor. The right hand is controlling up and down this cursor. And notice the heights. This is that this height above, and this one is that it's double as high, which is why the screen is green. All right, so this is probably a new kind of activity you haven't seen before. The child comes into the room and eventually originally tries to make the screen green. They lift one hand, uh, it's red. Then they mess around and suddenly, oh, wait, suddenly I made it green. Why is it green? It is green because this uh, hand is double as high as this one. It's a one per two ratio. So then the kids look at this and, and we say, can you move your hands and keep it green? Now, to keep it green, you need to keep the ratio. I hope you can see my eyes, my hands here, right? If, you, if you're at one and two heights and now you keep this fixed, it will no longer be one per two. It will be different ratio. You need to move your hands at different speeds to keep that ratio. The kids need to learn to move in a new way. You can try at home moving this way. It's not simple to move your hands up and down at different speeds, but we want children to struggle with that because through that they come to understand what is the sensory motor underpinning of the new concept they are to learn. So they try, usually kids try to move their hands this way, but if you move their hands and keeping this distance, you violate the one per two ratio and now it goes red again until they figure something out. And that is what's interesting for us as researchers. What is it precisely that suddenly the children figured out that now enables them to move in this way? Because the kids say to us, oh, I see, it's about the distance between my hands. And the higher my hands go, the bigger the distance needs to be. This is for us a critical, huge moment. It's like in an evolutionary scale, because we, we literally witness in real time and using all kinds of instruments, such as following the eye gaze of the child, where they are looking, what they are saying, and, and analyzing the movements, where we see that a new perception is born, okay? A new way of seeing the world is born literally in front of our eyes. And I can imagine that maybe from a traditional perspective, this looks kind of uh, mundane and maybe trivial. Oh, the kid is moving their hands. But no, from a, an analytic theoretical perspective, you actually witness how the child is forming a new perception that then becomes mathematical. It becomes mathematical because originally they're moving their hands in this way and learning how to move in a new way. But then we bring in symbolic artifacts. So this is the place where, if you recall, I'm going to use my metaphor, remember Adam and, and uh, culture or God, right? The child. And so this is the place now. The child has learned to move in a new way. And now the symbolic artifacts enter. But it's absolutely important to, to emphasize that the child has already built meaning. I already figured out how to move in a new way. And this is when we bring in the mathematical cavalry. We bring in all these symbolic artifacts. And then the kid says, oh, wait a moment. Oh, I can move my... Oh, I'll park my hand here, move here. Okay, I'll bring another one and two. And before you know it, in front of your eyes, they've discovered on their own a way, a new way of thinking, which is, they say, oh, it's one per two, one per two. And this is a par excellence, the discovery learning we are looking for. We provided the learning environment, we provided the task, and then we provided the tools. The children on their own figure out how to use our tools in order, in order to move forwards. Then we introduce, you see the numbers coming in on the, on, the, on the left. We introduce these numbers and the child says, oh, this is double that. So they're bringing mathematical meaning. This is that place, the place between my fingers, between Adam and, and God, between a child and culture. This is a place where children learn to move in new ways. They are learning through moving in new ways and then signifying this mathematically, right? And then onward, and we bring in these other kind of mathematical forms. Now, uh, as they continue working with our uh, system, so originally they, they thought it's this way and that was making it red. And then they saw, oh, okay, we see the hands need to change in order to make the screen green. We need to move in different speeds. The hands, the difference needs to grow as my hands go up. We brought in the grid. They figure out, oh, one per two. We're moving into kind of mathematical language, but it's always grounded in sensory motor ways of moving. We bring in the numbers, oh, one per two. Okay, so I will not dwell on this too much, 
but I could speak much more to mathematics education and why this is so important to connect between additive and multiplicative ways of thinking and how rational numbers first enter and because fractions are always so difficult, but here we have a natural entry that, that helps children develop their additive thinking into their multiplicative thinking rather than telling them these are different things, rather than telling them you're wrong, we say you're right, but you need to move on from this to a new way of thinking. And so rather than dwelling too much on this, there's something else I want to do with you, but just quickly give you a sense of how, how this looks. So here is a child and she is interacting difficult. with the, uh, this, uh, this device I call the Mathematics Imagery Trainer. You, you can see great. she's moving her hands at different oh, speeds <laughs> and making that green. So now you get a sense of what, what this first looked like. This is a very early experiment where we only are getting to know our system better. All right, so let's move on to, to some activity I want to do with you because, second, here we go. So we have a white screen. Now, why do I have a white screen here? Because I'm going to invite all of you to do some activity now. And it's probably going to be very strange for you, but hopefully maybe you'll remember something from that, that crazy Berkeley professor who gave you a talk and, uh, that, that evening. So I want to, to um, try and, and create opportunity for you to understand what is so exciting for us, why it is so critical for us that children see the world in a new way. Why am I making so much, uh, uh, such a big deal from kids who learn to move like this to kids to learn to move like that? Why is it so important for me that kids were suddenly noticing this gap between their hands and then saying, oh, it is getting bigger as my hands go up and it is getting smaller as I go down. So this is literally like one, like uh, the astronaut says, a, a, a small step for, uh, for, uh, for man, a huge step for mankind. This little thing, this little moment here, you know, if you will in, indulge with me, I believe is hugely important because there is nothing between my hands, okay? Take a, put on your philosophical theoretical glasses for a moment. There is nothing between my hands and yet I am seeing it as a thing. So this is a birth of a new thing. This is the creation, the mental creation of a new object. And once I have this object, I can say that it is growing and it is getting smaller. The higher my hands, the bigger it is, the, the lower, the smaller it is. And I uh, tell you with, with all my passion and conviction that this is a huge moment in perception and going on towards understanding because that is the moment where the new concept is born. So what I'm going to do with you now is an activity in which I want to try and convince you why it is so important to perceive it, things in new ways and how by, just by perceiving something in a new way, you can do something that will astonish yourself. All right, so I need for people to interact. I know that it's getting on in the evening and probably there's lovely uh, kitchen smells already in, in, in your home and you're all hungry and, and uh, impatient, but try and, and bear with me now as I take you through uh, an activity. So in this activity, what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to say, uh, give a beat like this. One, one, one. Now I want that with your Left hand, as I say one, I want you to beat twice. I'll beat here, but you can do it on the desk. So you go like one, two, one, two, one, two, one. I think this is easy enough. You can all do this. You're just beating at double speed. One, two, one, two. Now, now let's try doing three. So when I get one, you go one, two, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three. So here you have the one, two, one, two. Don't be shy, try this, actually try it. And here you have the one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, the question is, can you put them together? Can you put the one, two, one, two, together with the one, two, three, one, two, three. How do these things go together? Most people find it very difficult to coordinate two against three, all right? So this is when I'm going to uh, hopefully surprise you with your own ability to do that. And just like the kids discovered a new way of seeing the world that suddenly enabled them to think mathematically, I'm going to playfully introduce something here that will show you how you can do two against three. 
All right, so this is going to be a, a, a weird moment. I hope you're all sitting down. So here goes. Okay, so what is Shraddha Kapoor doing here? How in the world is this related to anything got to do with mathematics? It's not about her beauty and it's not about her voice. It's not about her acting. It's about her name. And why is her name important? Has anyone of you ever done karaoke? Try going like this. Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor. So you can hear this rhythm, right? Shra. Now, what you can do is you go Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor, Shraddha Kapoor. So you see how a name can enable us to be two against three. A moment ago, you were not able to do this. And now just by saying this name rhythmically, you are able to beat two against three. Yeah. Thank you, Sutapa. <laughs> so this is what I mean. Just like children suddenly saw a thing here and that enabled them to learn proportion and discover themselves. This is my metaphor. I gave you this this name. Now, why does it work? Of course, this is where you can get mathematical. Shra m ha kapur. Shra m ha kapur. Shra m ha. Because this structure is what in mathematics we call a common denominator, right? Three times two equals six. And that is why you get the structure of two against three. Right. Now, what if, if I ask you to do three against four, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, and here, right? So, and, and four, one, two, three. For that, even, the, uh, even the, 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 the beauty and voice and acting of Shraddha Kapoor is not enough. For that, we need experience. For that, we need... Oh, yes. Here we have Mithu and Chakraborty. Now, how is he going to help us? Again, it's about the name. Mithu Chakraborty. Mithu Chakraborty. Mithu Chakraborty. Pam. Pabam pam pabam pam pabam pam pabam. So the moment you engage with this name, you can go me sunchakra porti. Me sunka ka right? Ta 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 ta. Then it's one. Okay? So once again, right, so yeah, so that. That's my silliness, uh, but, but, but uh, what I'm, I'm trying to, to explain here is, is that by introducing something from the outside, by seeing your own actions in a new way, you are now able to, to think in new ways. You are now structures and capacity that you did not have before. And you see right here how I can move from, from this action towards mathematics. But it's something you already are able to do, something you've already experienced, something you've already succeeded in doing, which had just been very challenging for you. So once again, you see here, three against four gives us 12 common denominator. All right, that was easy. And here, um, brace yourself a wall of text. I want to explain what, what just happened now. Okay, why was this easy? I gave you a challenging task. There were two simultaneous yet independent motor action patterns. I gave you, you had online sensory feedback to evaluate your performance, just like the kids were having green. You could notice, was this going well? But despite understanding the go, we faced sensory motor overload. How do we do this? So we needed something. We needed somehow to relate across the two actions so as to coordinate them. We were looking for a way. We were looking for a thing, looking for a tool, looking for something that will enable us to do that. So we needed some com common frame of reference, some kind of, some kind of uniform structure. So I introduced some kind of supplementary form. It was an articulated goal structure that I gave you and it was a, a kind of object that was anchored in the world. You generated and maintained the structure. You attended to the structure and the structure collapsed two jobs into one. You were now, instead of how do I move this hand? Uh, the kids going this hand. No, now there's one thing, one thing that I can move. And the challenging task became a single co-anchored by manual coordination. Uh, let me uh, jump ahead to, to say this. I call this thing an attentional anchor. And in the time remaining until question answers, in the five minutes I have left, I want to show you 
some slides to show you what this thing actually looks like. So we've created apps for children to move their hands and discover new ways of thinking. And these are free downloads, tinyurl.com free, MITP, Mathematical Imagery Trainer for Proportion. And we've worked with them in classrooms. I grab, oh, grab, grab it, and then we're gonna so go. Try no, oh, together? Yeah, yeah, together. Go back to five. Yes. Go back to five. Right there. We're gonna go up. <laughs> One, four, up to four, all right? One. Okay. Children who are engaged in the collaborative joint action of together <laughs> moving the bars. And in order to do that, they need to create new language, new rhythm, and new ways of thinking together to solve the problem. So it's not just for individuals, it also works for, for, uh, for couples. Okay, so meanwhile, my friends in, in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, uh, we started using what's called eye tracking, instruments for seeing where the child is looking. And these uh, technologies enable us, this little orange dot is telling us where the child is looking, so that we know not only what they are doing and what they are saying, but how and where they're looking. And we were very curious at cases such, th these are my uh, Dutch uh, collaborators with Arthur Bakker, uh, the lead uh, researcher. What we are most interested in and let me, I'll, I'll just jump ahead to, okay. to cases where we uh, characterize how children are looking. I want to give you a particular uh, case which I found fascinating. Now, what we did here, we told children, instead of moving your hands this way, try to move your hands this way, all right? One hand up, one hand sideways. I think even Mithun could not help, help us with that. But here's what, what the kids were doing, the amazing things the kids were doing. See, we're, tr we're asking them, to move their hands up and down and try to make the screen green. And once again, only if the ratios are one per two, it will be green. But we start noticing that kids are looking here in the screen in places where there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Just like kids were looking here between their hands, in this case, looking at the screen in places where there were nothing. What did it turn out? It turned out that the kids were starting to imagine objects, just like here they were imagining the gap between their hands, here, they were imagining something else. Here they were imagining as if is on days ook weg there is some diagonal line. Yeah, well, it's much blijven nog op één lijn though. Did you see the way that kids yeah. are gesturing? Yeah. Okay. The okay. kids Prima. are seeing an imaginary uh, diagonal line, even though we Isan never asked ook... them to, even though we never told them. And so kan nog één keertje dan weer here is that a certain uh, image kan je nog een keertje dan weer dus bij het begin beginnen comes into ja. the eye. I put, I en dan dus weer naar buiten toe terwijl je het scherm komt en dan kijken of je het in één keer kan the, the child is saying to us if i imagine this white this line between my hands all i need to do is move the line sideways i'm moving the line sideways so it's like a succession of right angle triangles that is dilating what is again immensely important here is that the child invented this kind of tool to grab the world, invented it on their own. And so we've done lots of research on this. We've done research to figure out what these patterns enable a teacher to do. Because once uh, we figure out how the child is looking and what objects they are inventing in their minds, we can go from eye tracking, uh, the, uh, the teaching, to eye tracking in teaching. I won't show you this, but this is a case where a teacher already knows where the child is going to look and so they can imagine together. So this creating for us opportunities for children to imagine together. And then we can move the child, Stel, this is ook dat the child who's moved, uit. worked with a tablet, we can move them onto paper. And so once again, you see the, kind of the, the mathematics cavalry coming in. It's not just about moving your hands, it's about signifying this movement. So this is why I'm saying that learning Stel, is moving is... in new ways. We worked on other concepts such as parabolas, uh, with with uh, tracking both the, the eyes of the teacher and the students. We've published on all of this and people are interested. And we're working now also on the concepts from trigonometry. So this is going, like this is going in many directions. Oh, you might remember this, uh, this president, even he's learning how to do this. Um, we miss you. Uh, and, and so uh, we took this onwards and we created a, a, an artificial teacher, in, an artificially intelligent teacher who, who can interact Our with Our virtual children. teacher has a name. Meet Maria. 
This is the idea of taking this beyond just an individual sitting with a child. We can actually create opportunities for children to interact with uh, the software, no matter where they are. The teacher can teach them remotely. This is what it looks like. Let's try something else. Start at the bottom of the screen. You can only move. So you can see how the child is moving their hands. Nice. And the teacher interacts with her. So I want to end off and saying if, if there's one thing I want you to remember from all of this, it's this gesture, it's this hand, it's that children come into the world with capacity to move and do things and see the world in new ways. And these invisible aspects of facets of human behavior can become prominent through uh, designs, research designs that, that measure actions, that measure uh, sight, that talk to the children and see what work they need to do in order to appropriate uh, our cultural forms. And I'll slap this on here, but it's, uh, it's, it's mostly technical. And basically, educational designers can engineer and facilitate this process, this process of biological cognitive systems uh, adopting these cultural forms. And with that, for now, I'll say dhanyavad. <laughs> And I'll turn it over to Gaurava. Yes, uh, Dhanavad is perfectly right. And uh, I think you are, you are up on, in terms of your pronunciation as well. You're getting there, Professor. So I'm sure that by the time next time we host you, you'll be very, very, uh, I would say, proficient in it. OK, thank you, Professor. Lovely uh, having you with us. Uh, as I said, quite insightful. Uh, I will now open up the, the house for Q&A quickly. We have exact 14 minutes, in fact, by my clock. So, and because I know it is, it is in fact early morning at your time, and for us it is late evening, we are all heading to, towards, say, a dinner as well. Okay, so I will quickly, as I mentioned, I will take up, uh, and I'll in fact uh, request leaders, if you can have a question, which is, you can have a quick show of hand. Uh, and I will let you know a question, in fact. In fact, before we even go there, uh, I think Rajeshwari Savant, you have a question. Uh, if you can unmute yourself, ma'am, and ask, I have. Dr. Rajeshwari, you're not audible. In a sense, your, your voice is breaking, I believe. Yeah. Maybe she can type the question in into the chat. Sure, sure. Hello. Hello. Yeah, 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 you're audible, but you're very faint. Would you mind if you like, uh, I think either you can fix that up or possibly type your question? Mrs. Savan? You're not, uh, you're, you're right, oh, your voice is actually breaking. Yeah, if you can reconnect as well, no worries. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly move on and uh, as I said, I, either which way we can have a show of ham, hand in a thumbs up format or any format you wish. Okay. So Professor, I'll quickly ask you, uh, you a question which possibly will set the context as well because I've been watching some of your work as well. Uh, so so uh, while you correlate this to a very important subject to us. Uh, are there any other examples possibly which you can say in which the, the learning patterns of, uh, of a typical young child is also changing in a way? Apart from say a mathematical pattern, which is, uh, uh, which is largely on the cognitive side as well, if I may say. Well, any other observations? Because I think you guys do a lot of research at your end. And uh, keeping in view, especially the online adoption, which is happening now very strongly. Yeah. So uh, I would go back to, to that issue and asking when, when you deliberate over what types of educational technology to adopt, I would always use this criterion of asking, does it give children opportunities to engage, not just answering problems according to some kind of algorithm, but rather in ways that they can make sense, that they can interact with objects mm -hmm. and they can, we use the funny word ground, like bring it down to the ground, like electricity grounding, like grounding all these symbols in something that makes sense. 
Our mm. mind is a sense-making, uh, I hesitate to call it machine. I'll call it an organism uh, or system. Our mind is a Correct. sense-making system. We Correct. want to grasp onto something. It is not for no reason that we have these colloquial, we say, oh, I got it. Oh, I'm grasping the idea. Hold on to an idea. It is not for no reason. It's not some kind of uh, etymological quirk. We literally think of ideas as things. And even when they are uh, invisible, invisible and even when we think of them as abstract, they are still objects that we manipulate. And, and so across any, uh, to, to answer your question, uh, Gaurava, in, in any case where a child is developing in a culture, there's always a negotiation between how you come into the world with your biological cognitive systems and how you appropriate that way of work, even walking something as simple as walking, where you think is completely natural, people learn various cultural gates. By gate, I mean ways of walking. People mm -hmm. have different ways of... So if it's, it's something as simple as walking, and obviously talking, and I mean, mm -hmm. in India, you have so many languages, right? It, it, even if, if it's uh, in these very natural, sort of simple cultural ways, then, then a fortiori, it, it's, it's in, in mathematics. So I would say that across the board, whenever you're looking at child development, it's always development in context. It's always okay. in some kind of cultural milieu. And then the question is, what are the resources that we are giving? And I believe that these resources, their quality and the nature of their types are contingent on our understanding of what it means for humans to, to learn. Well, exactly, well, which is why I wanted to bring this up because, and I mentioned to you last evening that we've been now having a new education policy document ahead of us and that's all about experiential learning in, in many ways i would say so we are making that transition as a country as well our learnings are coming from that very very traditional rot learning to more of an experiential experiential learning so i think we are making that transition and maybe we will have one more conversation with you which will be actually uh, more detailed. I will, in fact, I will throw you some uh, some pointers because I have gained few pointers after this session, and I'm sure that will help us. So what will, what I'm going to do is I'll take up that question with Dr. Savant was asking. She has put that on the chat for us. The abacus classes that have been conducted could that also be related to the movement of hands for calculating? That's the question. Uh, Dr. Rajeshwari Savant has posed for you, yeah. Thank you, doctor, for that most interesting question. An abacus is a wonderful example of a cultural artifact that integrates manipulation with computation. And in that case, you can actually go so very far in your reasoning without even ever writing anything down. It's almost like, it's like uh, languages that are oral languages that have no form of writing. With the abacus, you need not ever actually write down the numbers. Now, of course, people do that and integrate that, but I'm just to say, here is a, an object that extends our cognition by instantiated in forms of actual tokens whose manipulation, rule-based manipulation, then gives us a new form that represents for us uh, quantities. Now, the fascinating thing about the abacus, research on the abacus by people like Hatano and Inagaki, and, and uh, Stigler and, and uh, people in the lab of Susan Golden Meadow and other places. What they find is that if you are a novice, then you have to work with this very slowly. As you get better and better, at a certain point, you can, you can this is, will sound strange, you can use the abacus without an actual concrete abacus. So you see children who are experts at it, in Japan it's called a soroban, they will sit there without a real abacus, just their hands. You give them a multi-digit multiplication and you, see, you can see how they're fidgeting their fingers. They are literally speed manipulating an imaginary abacus. And then they write down the visualizing. answer. Visualizing. Mm -hmm. right. Well, it's visualizing, but it, okay. you know, it's, it's all of the sensorial modalities are then, okay. are then introduced there. So what you see is that the mind has appropriated a cultural artifact in ways that now enable them to extend their cognition going far beyond what you could do without that by, by imagining this object. But that just brings home my point that mathematics is concrete. And that is a one, I really thank you, doctor, for, for that question, because that's a wonderful example of what I mean by learning is moving in new ways. And even when you don't see it, somebody from the outside comes in, why is this child fidgeting her fingers? Well, it's because she's manipulating an abacus. You cannot see it, 
She cannot mm -hmm. actually see it, but mm -hmm. she imagines it. And yeah. that is what I mean by grounding uh, yeah. mathematical ideas in, in uh, I, sensory motor I action. I quickly take a one more question, Professor. That's an, and in fact, I, I like that question, interesting question. In fact, we have two questions, but I'll go to the second one first. The logic, I'll come to yours a little later. Uh, just, just for the uh, context of the relevance, Professor, what is uh, learning moving in the new way for a non-mathematical person example? Okay, so um, hopefully the example of moving your hands mm -hmm. this way is it's like it's almost as rudimentary as I can get and I trust that any person will understand and I know that because I work with very young children but what you see is initially they and this is something any of us would do it's not something about if I were put in a room this hand moves this object this map and, and I say make the screen green and I flail my hand suddenly it's green I say okay find another one I too would think oh I'm looking for some method in the madness I'm saying something needs to stay the same. So I believe it is this thing that will stay the same, but then the screen goes red. So with time I start, oh wait, I'm fixing it. And before you know it, I say, oh, the higher the hands go, the bigger the difference. So this is a way, learning to move in a new way. It's like riding the bicycle. Riding the bicycle is strange because it, in a way it's like walking, right? But it takes the walking and makes it circular. So it's not a disconnect between walking and cycling. It's not, rather, it's you know how to walk, but then comes, remember, <laughs> then comes culture and brings in the bicycle, and the walking becomes, starts becoming circular. So you are adapting your walking capacity into the cycling capacity. But once again, we can see the connection. Children are not born, we didn't evolve to ride a bicycle, right? We didn't, and yet we can Absolutely. do that. Right. I, uh, Tilogji, you want to ask a question because you have also put that on the chat? Yeah. Or, or should I read your question? Good evening, good evening Professor. Good evening, uh, Gaurav. Good evening. I just wanted to ask you when we talk about the patterns, uh, do we talk about the bodily kinesthetics? Uh, also, how are they related to our uh, patterns? Because, you know, the children learn through certain patterns. Uh, it could be musical pattern, it could be bodily kinesthetics, it could be, um, you know, interpersonal way of uh, learning the things. May I know how would you connect the patterns with the kinesthetic uh, intelligence of the child? Thank you very much. Wonderful question. So we're talking about kinesthetic patterns. Where do they come from? How do they emerge? How do they relate to other modalities? So we use this word modality, where we mean we, can, we have uh, various uh, senses, but there are other, other senses we often don't talk about, such as the kinesthetic, the proprioceptive, the somatic, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, what we see in our research is that children are always looking, as you say, for patterns. Patterns are not just static. It's not just patterns as I see here in art. Patterns are dynamical. That means it's not just about space, but about time. And as you say, rhythm. What is rhythm? Rhythm is temporal patterns. Just like if you play a raga, right? You start out with a drone on the sitar, but at a certain point, it starts coming in. It starts coming in. And we have found that children are naturally seeking, naturally seeking rhythmic patterns in their kinesthetic interactions. And we have published on this. I'll, I can back channel uh, maybe through Guara, I can share with you. We have found that when children try to learn to move in a new way, they start introducing rhythmicality. Rhythmicality comes as if out of nowhere. We know for sure, for instance, if you and I had to row a boat together, probably at some moment, if we're sitting side by side, we'd probably go, and a one, and a two, because the rhythmic structure enables you and me to solve a very pragmatic problem is, how can we conduct this joint collaborative action in ways that make our motions efficacious? So rhythm comes into the world as a pragmatic social uh, solution to the coordination of collaboratively enacting a certain cultural practice. And even when the child is working on her own, we can see how they start introducing and on and to, uh, because it, once again, the temporal pattern collapses 
a challenging moment into some sequence of iterated action. And, but in order to, to, for us to avail of this uh, capacity, we need to remember that we're not talking just about static images, but about dynamical activity, which is a challenge for teachers who began, uh, who, who like me, learned a traditional way, but we need to remember that learning is moving in new ways. So thank you very much for that question. I just wanted to extend it, but can the children create their own patterns? Should they be given that liberty and freedom to create their patterns and uh, yeah. be dynamic in their way of learning? Rather Absolutely. than the teacher setting up the patterns. Absolutely. So learning is always a negotiation between the students and the teacher. What we find, again, I can share a different publication on that. Children figure out many ways of working, but uh, the, the deep learning we find is not just in each one, but helping them connect between the two of them. For example, if you notice that this hand is always double as high as this one, and that maybe separately you notice that the, this hand needs to move double as fast as this one, well, why is that the case? Or why is it the case that if the, if the gap keeps growing, then actually that is correlated with the idea that this one is always double as high? And again, these are small steps for us, but for eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, these are deep and profound aha moments where they can experience their own agency in developing their new insights into how different ways of moving become one and the same thing when you look at it from the perspective of the discipline such as mathematics, which just like the abacus, when you put things on paper, when you put things out there, when you have words, we have all of these uh, cultural resources, semiotic resources, then you can connect between two different ways of moving and you switch from just moving to thinking about moving. Okay. Thank you, thank you, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay, completely out of time, uh, Professor, but I'll take one more question if you allow me. A very simple one, how practically any mathematical concept can be developed? Because uh, obviously a person is looking at some resources. I think it is on the chat. In fact, I'm, I'm taking up this question from Pushparaj Somvanshi. Uh, the question is, the core of the question is, how can we practically develop a mathematical concept? So I would probably need uh, the, the, the person to, to maybe to rephrase. When you say practically develop, mm -hmm. do you, are you asking, is this a question of so, does so my framework mean, extend into yeah, higher grades? Or? So let me just quickly read the entire bit uh, because A, he is looking at resources. Then he says, goes on to say that concept uh, makes students learn uh, developing as in we can take ideas for developing any concept and make students learn. Please consider the fact that in India, we are not having such labs or equipment to establish such concepts. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So the kind of research that I do, some people work on the history of education, how did it develop in right writing. Some people work on, not on the past, but on the present. They go into classrooms, they interview children, they interview teachers and tell how they think. My work is on the future. The kind of work I do is called design-based educational research. Mm -hmm. So I'm an educational designer, but in the context of that practice of designing, inventing, and trying, evaluating things, I engage in problems. I encounter problems and issues and phenomena that are interesting to my field. So my research is in the context of designing the future. So it's, it's a bit like if maybe 100 years ago, um, people say that Henry Ford, <laughs> the, who, who started the, the Ford industry, it is attributed to him, probably never said that, but people say, attribute to him that he says, um, if, they, if they had asked me, if, if, if I had done what, what, you know, what people wanted, I would, I would make faster horses, okay? <laughs> but instead I made the car. So we are now in, in a moment of paradigm change where there are new technologies and new possibilities. So it's true that it's a huge concern. What should I do now? What should I do tomorrow in my classroom? Uh, but we are working on what will be the future and the future actually comes faster than you think. Like Matific has some interesting things you could interact with, but, and we're building these kinds of things. But for now, just going to the classroom, I would say you have always to be attentive to how the child is trying to make sense. Always look at it this way, not this way, not this way, not that way. <laughs> But always, what, how is the child thinking? How are they making sense? Never say the child is wrong. 
well, okay, they got the, they, they failed something on the, no, but the thinking, th human thinking is not wrong. Human thinking is fascinating and wonderful, but how can we work with that kind of thinking and find a way of negotiating and what technologies, writ large from paper and abac, how can we make these things meet, okay? So, so that's, that's a message for now. Be very attentive to how your children are thinking and think with them. And lovely. Thank you. In fact, we, as I said, the, uh, there are questions which are cropping up. In fact, if you look at the chat, Chandra Lekha, Bazaz, would you, uh, I, I'm completely out of time, uh, but what I can do for you is that I'll note, note down this question and I can send this to the professor. Professor, if you can help uh, answering that question. Ms. Chandra, uh, Chandra Lekha, will that help you? If you can unmute yourself, ma'am. Because I think we are five minutes already ahead yeah, of us. Sure. Yeah, sure. I'm so thankful to you for considering that. Thank you oh, so sure. much. We, we'll get that answered for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Professor. Uh, great having you with us uh, early morning there. Uh, so I, I hope you have a great day ahead of you. And uh, we should circle back once more. And she should have uh, one more detailed discussion with you sooner than later, possibly. Thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you very much for attending this uh, Matisse Surely. seminar. And thank you every educator who had joined us from different parts of the world. Uh, thank you very much, predominantly Indian population, but I, I could read there was someone from Lebanon as well. So thank you for joining Salam alaikum. Yes, <laughs> so take care everybody. Uh, stay safe and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Take Bye. care.